Hey, everyone. Um, so I'll be talking today about rapidly iterating across platforms using server-driven UI. A little bit about who I am. So I'm an Android engineer at Airbnb, and I've previously worked on front-end web at Airbnb as well. Um, I work on the Trip Platform team, which is a team that works on the itinerary and reservation screens, which you've probably seen if you've ever booked an Airbnb. Um, and in my spare time, I'm a power lifter and a whiskey connoisseur. <laughs> Um, so what I'll be talking about today is I'll be talking about this problem we were facing at Airbnb, where we need to move really fast and push product quickly, but we also want to be pushing out that product to three different platforms, Android, iOS, and web. I'll talk about why server-driven UI was a good fit for solving this problem, and then I'll deep dive into the Android implementation. Finally, I'll talk about some other case studies for how we're using server-driven UI in other areas um, of our code base at Airbnb. Um, so really quick, since this is a, this is a general tech conference, uh, is anyone in here an Android developer? OK, a couple. Um, how about iOS web or backend? OK, so that's like most of the room. So some of my code samples here will be in Android, but I'll explain them um, so you don't, don't necessarily have to have an Android background. And all of my case studies and um, kind of the intro will be very understandable, even if you're not an Android developer. So Airbnb started out as an accommodations business, a place where you book a home uh, when you're traveling. And when you book a home on Airbnb, you'll see a screen that looks like this to show you the details of your reservation. So you can see here there's a carousel with some photos, uh, there's a title, and there's some buttons to give you directions to your home, um, help you contact your, your host, and so on. Um, in 2016, we launched a product that fundamentally changed how Airbnb works as a travel company. We launched a product called Experiences, and these are uh, an activity that you can do with a local host when you're traveling. When we launched this new product, we also created a reservation screen for an experience. And the reservation screen for an experience looks like this. You can see it's got a lot of similarities with this home reservation screen. It has a carousel and a title, and it also has some buttons that you can click on, but they're a little bit different. Um, launching experiences really changed how Airbnb thinks about travel. We went from being just about accommodations to being about your end-to-end -end trip. And so since then, we've added more and more products to kind of fill out this end-to-end -end trip experience. So for example, you can book um, a restaurant on Airbnb, and we have a reservation screen that we built out that looks like this, also very similar. Um, and we added a feature called Freeform Events, where you can add events that are populated by either data that you input or Google, the Google Places API. So you can see here, we've launched a bunch of things, um, and they all look pretty similar, but they have a few subtle differences. After doing this a couple of times, my team got together and realized something. We were building nearly the same screen, multiplying our efforts across the code base. And because Airbnb is a mobile forward company where we want to launch things on Android, iOS, and web, we were also duplicating our efforts across, the platform, across platforms. After doing this a few times, the developers, thought, the developers working on this project thought, there's got to be a better way. There has to be a better way of doing this than just building the same screen again and again every time we launch a product. So we all got together, the iOS, Android, web, and backend developers, and we thought about the criteria for what an ideal system would be. So here's what we came up with. First of all, we wanted um, a system that would be easy to understand, because the way that we work with our partner teams um, at Airbnb is that they're trying to launch a product, and they have a lot of different things to do, and one of them is to launch a reservation screen. So we, want, we have teams that are coming in, and they need to get a reservation screen launched as fast as possible, and then they need to go back to whatever else they need to do to launch the product. So we needed something where we could onboard people quickly, and there wouldn't be a whole lot of maintenance for our partner teams once they've launched a reservation. We all know designers like to paint outside the lines. Uh, we wanted a system where we would nudge designers to use an existing kind of user paradigm for what a reservation would look like, but inevitably, designers are going to want to break those rules and add something new at some point. So we wanted to have flexibility so that we could design for highlighting different kinds of product, products and adding new components, um, but a system that would nudge people in a certain visual language. 
We want it to be able to launch without a Play Store or App Store release. So at Airbnb, we release a new version of the app every week, and we launch on a two-week cadence, meaning once you've mer merged those changes into a new release, it takes a week of QA testing and a week of ramping up the, the release for that to actually get to your users. Um, this is a pretty long period of time, and if you forget something in that initial release, you're kind of out of luck for another week or two. So we wanted something where we could still make changes, but avoid this release cycle if we could. Um, we wanted to minimize repetition. Every time we launched something, we would be doing a lot of boilerplate to create a new screen, but it was the same thing that we had done for building the previous screen. Um, and we wanted to make, so we wanted to maintain basically like one view per platform for the screen, even though it's rendering different types of reservations. And finally, we wanted something that would be easy to maintain. In our old system, we found there might be a bug on the home reservation screen, and then we'd see exactly the same bug in the experiences reservation screen. And so we'd have to go in and fix it in two places. We wanted something where if you fix it on one platform, it gets fixed on every instance of that, every type of reservation where you see that. After thinking about this criteria, the solution that we decided on is called server-driven UI. Let's talk about how this screen is rendered using server-driven UI and what exactly that means. On a high level, what server-driven UI means is that the API tells the client what components to render and with what content. So the API is sending down models for UI components rather than server models for something like, say, a reservation. Looking at this API response, you can see the bulk of it is an array of rows. And notice here that each row has a type. So we've got a carousel row, we've got a title row, an action row, and a map row. We're taking advantage of polymorphism here, which in a really academic sense means the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. Um, it's simpler than it sounds though, it's really what it is, is we have a super type row, um, and this is a super class, and that row dictates that any subtypes of this class have an ID and a type. And then we have subtypes of this row, such as a map row, and that map row will implement an ID and a type uh, because it's inheriting from the super class, and it also will have some map row specific properties. So in this case, we're passing in a latitude and a longitude to this row. Similarly, if we have a link row subtype, uh, that link row subtype implements the ID and type, and it also has a deep link, because a link row will redirect the user to a different part of the app or website when they tap on it. Um, so this is how we're using polymorphism in our API to implement a bunch of different row types in our API response. Okay, so we're sending up a bunch of different row components in the API response. Those get sent to the client, and this is, it. This is Android code, but uh, we'll go into this in a little more depth later. Basically what happens when the API response gets sent to the client is the client deserializes it and turns it into a data model. So we're taking the row carousel class, uh, we're taking the carousel row and turning it into a carousel row data model. And so on and so forth for each respective type. And our front end web code, which is using React, it looks pretty similar. We've got a mapping that takes uh, the row that's specified in the API, and it's turning it into a React component. So now that we've turned, uh, we've mapped that JSON response into a data model, the rendering layer on the platform will then take that and turn it into UI components. So on our front end web, uh, web code, that's React. And at Airbnb, we use a library called Epoxy for Android and iOS to take uh, views and turn them into rendered views. So you can see here, those get turned into their components. So on a really high level, how server-driven UI works is that we send up some, some UI components in the API, they get deserialized to a data model and passed to the rendering framework, and then the rendering framework maps those into a component that's rendered on the screen. Let's say that we change our mind with the product here. Let's say that we want to change that carousel row to be a map row instead. Well, we've implemented a map row on all of the clients, so all we need to do is change that API response so that it's sending up a map row instead. 
And now it's instantly updated on all of the clients across platforms. And very similarly, if we want to just change the ordering of something, like the title row and the action row, we just make one backend change. And now this is updated everywhere. We don't have to go into each client to make that change. Okay, so we built out this system and started using it for a few different product launches. And we found some benefits after building this out that we didn't initially expect. So one thing was that we only had to build a lot of things once. On the reservation screen, we have a lot of things built into the screen, such as performance improvements. Um, on the native clients, we offline cache the reservations so that a user who's not online can still see uh, details about their reservation. Um, we also have logging and accessibility built into the screen. So now, if a partner or team reuses this system, um, they don't actually have to think about these things because it's reusing the screen we've already built. So these things are already coming with the system. The system also easily accommodates changing minds. If we want to reskin the system or make it look a little bit different, we can keep that same mapping but just change the look and feel of it really easily. It also reuses our existing UI component library really nicely. So at Airbnb, we have a component library called the Design Language System. And it's a library where each component is implemented across Android, iOS, and web. So we already had this system that product engineers were contributing to for their everyday product work anyway. And we could just take advantage of those existing components that exist across three platforms and plug our system into it. And finally, uh, this system came with the benefit of letting us iterate and reconfigure and experiment in our own time. We knew going in that it would be a benefit that we could avoid parts of the release cycle, but we really underestimated how much we would end up using this. Um, anytime we need to make a change, whether that's to content or to push up a whole new reservation, um, we can just make a simple change on the back end that really helps us move fast. Okay, so that's the high level of how our system works on all different devices. Let's go into the Android code to see exactly how that response is parsed. On Android, the first step is that a JSON blob is sent up to the Android device, and then we parse that network response into an array of rows. The rows are then parsed into their respective subtypes, um, and then we pass them to the fragment and UI controller. So you can just think of this as the code that's rendering the screen on Android. Um, and then the, the fragment and the UI controller will configure those models to actually build out the components. Here's what the code looks like for this first step, parsing the network response. Um, at Airbnb, we're using a library called Jackson for the screen to deserialize the JSON and turn it into a Java class that's the data model. So Jackson uses annotations um, pretty heavily. So you can see here, um, there's a lot going on, but the main thing is just that we're taking, um, we're taking that JSON response and we're parsing that big array of rows into a data model, uh, an array of data models. And the row data model is our super class. Then uh, that big array of rows gets parsed into JSON, uh, into subtypes. Again, using Jackson, we have, a, we have a big list of supported subtypes here. And what's going on is this is the Jackson annotation to say, we want to make a new subtype. And this is something that's going to be coming from a JSON blob. We pass in uh, to this function a name. And this corresponds to how we designate a row type on the API response. And then we pass in a value and the value is a Java class that we want to deserialize the JSON into. So in this case, we're trying to declare a link row data model type. Um, so we pass, it, we pass this data to a link row data model class. And that class looks something like this. You can see that it's implementing the super type of data model. So this is implementing a row data model. And then we're declaring here with annotations that this link row will have different properties coming from the JSON. So we've got an ID, which is one of the properties that the superclass dictates all row types implement. And then we've got a title and an app URL. 
because a link row is a row where you'll see a title, and when you tap on it, it will redirect you to a different part of the app. All right, so now we've taken the API response. We've parsed it into a set of different rows. Now we're going to pass that to our UI rendering um, part of the system. So in Android, this is something called a fragment, and we have a UI controller to add things to that fragment. I won't go into too much detail about epoxy, but I'll just explain what it is really briefly. Um, epoxy on Android is a library for building complex screens in a recycler view. Um, it's got a nice declarative syntax, and that's good for our purposes because we want to be able to support a lot of different row types, but not necessarily render them all at the same time. We want the row types to be supported, but only rendered when the API tells us to, re to render them. So epoxy is really nice because it lets you add a lot of things to a recycler view easily, but you don't have to add them all. You can configure them based on that API response. So every screen that uses epoxy has um, a UI controller. And so our epoxy controller is the thing that uh, takes a data model and adds a component for it to our screen. You can see here, this is, um, this is written in a language called Kotlin. And we've got this big when statement, which is it's like a switch statement. What this statement does is it takes a row data model, and it checks what subtype that data model is. So, you can see here we have a link row data model, and then it will call a build model function on that subtype. Um, so here, this is what the build model function looks like. What we're doing is we're adding um, a basic row component, which is a UI component in our component library. And we want to specify that it has an ID, it has a title, and these are, the title here is coming from our uh, data model that we parsed from the response. And it's got an on-click listener. And so when this component is tapped on, we'll navigate to the app URL that was sent up from our API response. So that's how we take the data models and turn them into UI components that Epoxy will then add to the screen. Once Epoxy adds those UI models, they get rendered in the Android client. So that's how we take this API response and turn it into this screen on Android. So my team built out this system for reservations specifically. And we started talking to other teams at Airbnb who were working on product as well. And they were having a lot of the same pain points we were having with regards to wanting to move fast, but having difficulty keeping consistency and moving fast enough on all platforms. Um, this approach became popular at Airbnb, and some teams did some other really cool things with it for different use cases. So I'll give you one example here. Uh, my first example is a system called Wally. -E. It's a system that our host team built out. Um, they built it out to build user flows as a service. And what I mean by a user flow is a series of screens where you have input on each screen and the input needs to be validated. You might be thinking to yourself, building forms is really simple, right? Why would you need a, a full system for this? Um, has anyone in the room ever tried to list their home or list a home on Airbnb before? Yeah, someone back there? Uh, it's really complicated, isn't it? Um, because we want to have, uh, we want to give host the tools to show off like the unique properties of their home, but we also want to make sure it's accurate for guests and complies with a bunch of regulations for safety and local laws. There's a lot of different steps to our listing flow, and there's also a lot of things we need to validate in our listing flow. So we end up having some really complicated forms for that. I'll give you an example. So we have this step in our listing flow where the first question is, uh, what type of place are you listing? And the options here are entire home, uh, a private room, or a shared room. So let's suppose that we check entire, entire home. The next question asks what the property type is. And the types of options here are an apartment, a bed and breakfast, a house, um, a tree house, a yurt. 
there could be many, many different options. So let's say we choose um, bed and breakfast. Because Airbnb defines a bed and breakfast as a private room in a home with other private rooms, we're actually going to default that question back to uh, from entire home back to private room. And so what's, what's happening here is we're saying the input is invalid based on the input of both questions, and we want to default it back to um, a valid answer. So this is just one example of a complex interaction happening in our forms. Um, another example is that in these really long flows where there's a lot of steps, you might end up with a lot of branching logic. So depending on how a user answers a question, they might see a whole new set of steps, whereas a user who answers the question in a different way would skip over those steps. Um, so in forms where we have a lot of different stuff going on, uh, we often use branching logic. And also at Airbnb, we like to do A-B testing. And so we might have an experiment where we change the order of the steps. Particularly in our host onboarding flow, this can get, this can get complicated because there's a lot of steps and a lot of things going on, and we might have any combination of these different things. Previously, how it was handled was by encoding this logic on the client. <laughs> and this gets unwieldy really fast. Um, even if you've got really attentive and detail-oriented developers, um, if you've got you know, 20 plus steps in your flow and you're making changes to it constantly for product and you're also experimenting on it, um, it gets really, it's really easy to, for things to get inconsistent and you'll find yourself fixing something on Android only to find it pop up on iOS and so on. So Wally was built to solve this, solve this problem. And the idea was we can take some of that logic that was previously encoded on the client and instead send it up from the server. So here's what a Wally JSON payload looks like. First, it's got an array of components. And this is going to look pretty similar to what the reservation component list looked like. Then it's got an ordered list of screens. And the ordered list of screens comes with conditions for validation for this particular ordered list of screens. So the clients know how to interpret this Wally syntax to know if a current state is valid or not, but they don't know what exactly the, the conditions for validation are. That part, is sent up, uh, that part is sent up from the server. So we take some of that logic of like what exactly for this particular screen are the conditions we want to validate and send that to the server. Um, and instead, the clients just know how to evaluate a general syntax for um, seeing if something is valid or completed. Similarly, a Wally JSON payload includes questions that also include conditions for validation. And finally, the API response for Wally includes answers, which could be pre-populated, previously answered, or empty. And those might be used to validate those questions. Here's a really simple Wally screen to explain how this works. So here you can see we've got kind of a title, and we have a toggle, a toggle row here. And so the toggle row is something that you can tap on. It's kind of like a checkbox to say true or false. And then at the bottom, there's a, there's a next button, which you can see is currently disabled. So the first part of the API response for Wally is a, a set of questions. And there's only one question on the screen. So it's sending down an ID, which is a sample Boolean question. And the type of this question is Boolean, because the answer could be true or false. The API response also includes a list of components, which again is going to be pretty similar to what we saw with the reservation screen. It's got kind of an ID, some phrases, and a type. And then there's a set of steps. And this is where you can see how the, the conditions for validation work. So the API response is saying there's a next button. And we want it to be disabled when the question with ID sample Boolean question equals false. And so as you see in the UI, the checkbox, uh, the toggle row is checked to false, so the next button is disabled. But if the user checks on that um, toggle row and turns it to true, uh, Wally will reevaluate these conditions on the, on the client and see, OK, this answer doesn't equal false, so now we don't want the next button to be disabled. 
And finally, the Wally uh, JSON response has a couple other things in it. It also has a redirect URL um, for when the user submits the form, where do we go? So that's an example of how Wally will validate within one screen different form inputs. Wally also will handle navigating between screens and some validation conditions related to that. On a high level, how this works is Wally is given a list of steps, and it will hide and show those steps based on state. So in this example, we've got a review flow for when a guest stays in a home, and they're asked how their stay was. The first question has a one to five star rating. And let's say we had a good stay, so we're rating it four stars. We want to show this second step, which says, did the host do anything special to make your stay great? Um, it wouldn't make sense to show this if you had a bad one-star stay. So how this step works is we only want to show step two when step one is a four to five star rating. Um, so Wally will send this down in that ordered list of steps, and it will send conditions for when to show this step. Um, and when the user answers the first step, Wally will evaluate whether it needs to show the second step or not. And if we rated something smaller, then that step just gets hidden. Okay, so that's, that's another example of how we're using server-driven UI at Airbnb for forms. Um, Wally and the reservations platform became really popular at Airbnb, and people, um, people also started using server-driven UI for other, other use cases that were really feature-specific, um, kind of like how the reservation system is really specific to the reservations platform. This got a little out of hand, and we actually ended up with over 10 systems um, for feature-specific kinds of server-driven UI, things that would only translate to like one feature. Um, our infra team noticed that there was a lot of extra work being put in because every time you need to build out one of these systems, you're building out that API spec and some of the parsing that goes into building the components. So they thought maybe there's a way that we could build some more generalized infrastructure so that when product teams want to use server-driven UI, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Lona Dynamic UI is the system that they're currently working on to solve this problem. The premise of Lona is that we want to scale server-driven UI to hundreds of developers at Airbnb sustainably. And the team working on this um, is very small. It has about four engineers working on it. And so they need to do that in a way where uh, they can kind of scale the small number of engineers to build out a system that, that's going to serve many different developers at Airbnb. Um, so there's a few things that Lona offers to accomplish this. The first thing is Lona has a unified format for views, which you can think about as a formalized contract between what the API uh, is going to send down and what the client understands from a Lona response. The second thing Lona offers is backend tooling to enforce this format and make sure that anything coming out from the backend uh, that's a Lona response is something that the clients will actually understand and be able to render. And finally, Lona offers client-side frameworks to render the views. So let's jump into this first thing, a unified format for describing views. Um, again, we have this, this component system called the design language system, where we already have a ton of different components that have built, been built out cross-platform. So Lona kind of wants to take this um, and take advantage of it and use a lot of these different design language components to be supported in the system um, out of the box. And they're specified with an API spec that's, again, going to look pretty similar to the other systems we saw. Um, this is an example component where you have a type, and it's passing down some parameters for a title and a subtitle. Um, and it has an on-press action for this particular component where if you tap on the component, it will redirect you via a deep link to a different part of the app. The second thing that Lona is offering, the backend tooling to enforce the format, is pretty interesting and pretty unique. So the Lona API spec isn't built out with something like YAML or XML. It's built out with a Kotlin domain-specific language, meaning we've kind of built out the special syntax for um, how to build Lona components. And the important thing about this is that 
The fact that it's written in Kotlin makes it very easy to build tooling on top of it because Kotlin is a JVM language and we use it in other parts of the company for a lot of different things. Um, so building the spec out in Kotlin gives us some interesting choices with what we can do with tooling. Um, at Airbnb, uh, we have a service-oriented architecture, meaning we have a lot of different backend services that service different parts of our app. Um, and product teams will maintain um, one or more services for their part of the app. Um, so we didn't want to build Lona validation into a particular service in a really specific way um, because we have all this huge variety of services. We wanted something where it would not intrude on how they structure their service, but it would just check if it's sending up a valid Lona response for the screens that are supposed to be in a Lona format. So instead, we have a Lona validator that kind of that will just take in a response, make sure that it conforms to the client to the client spec, and that the clients will implement it, and then it will send it on if it's a valid response. And finally, Lona offers cl uh, client frameworks to render the views. So let's take a look at what that looks like on Android. So the first thing is on Android, you need to get, um, you need to get the API response, the JSON response. So pr presumably, we'll do a network request and get that JSON response. Then uh, the developer will take that JSON response and pass it into a function called lonafile.make, and then call make models on it. What this make models function returns is a list of epoxy models. Um, remember that an epoxy model is basically just a, a UI model for something that we're going to add to a screen. Then once we get that list of UI models, they're added to the, added to the controller and added to the screen. So this is, with Lona, this is all a developer has to do to get their Lona screen rendered. They just fetch the JSON, call that make models method, and add them to the, to the builder. So what's going on under the hood in make models to make that so easy? If you recall with the generic reservations framework, we had kind of three steps. You send up components from the API, you map them to data models, and then you pass them to the rendering framework, which will turn them into UI components. This Lona call kind of simplifies this into one step, where you pass the API response, and they get turned directly into UI models. So this saves developers on Android and iOS from having to write all those data models, which is pretty tedious, uh, especially when you're building out lots and lots of components. And how Lona accomplishes this without scaling this work to be un untenable for the infra team is that it's using code gen. Um, so what happens when you add something to the Lona spec is on Android, um, a builder is created that will automatically deserialize a given spec, uh, a given component in the spec. And it uses the properties specified in the spec so that this builder could be generated. Um, so here's an example. This is, a, this is a builder that was generated for a basic row model. And what happens is we pass in some JSON to this builder, and it will look for params and content fields in that JSON. And we know that those will exist based on what's been specified in the spec. Then we create a, a new UI model, and it checks for an ID and a title, because those are required properties in our spec. It will also check to see if there's a subtitle, which is an optional property. Um, those then get added to the UI model and then pass back in that array. Lona also uses CodeGen to help make continuous integration testing better as well. So Lona has an extensive set of test JSON responses. And whenever the Lona spec, um, whenever the Lona spec is changed, they're generated directly from that spec. And so the test JSON responses are stubbed into CI for the clients, so for Android. And so we can automatically test when there's a change to the spec and we update it on Android. Uh, we make sure that the clients will actually implement those changes to the spec. So we're never sending something up to clients that they don't understand or haven't implemented yet. Another way that Lona makes 
server-driven UI more scalable and more generalizable for the rest of Airbnb is that it has different levels of integration. So if you recall, we have this system of offerings from Lona. And you could use all of these things together so that you have an API spec, the backend tooling, and the client frameworks all working together. But what if you have an existing system like Lona? Are you just out of luck? Do you still have to build all these things from scratch? Um, well, a system like Wally could actually take advantage of this tooling that Lona is building out. And in fact, we're switching Wally over to do this right now. Um, so Wally already has its own backend service. We're not going to touch that. Um, and it's outputting, um, it's going to reuse that unified format, that spec. Um, and, but on the client, we're still going to use Wally to render things, um, to render things differently. We're not going to use the client tooling from Lona because Wally has some additional functionality for validating forms. So we can get some of the benefits of reusing the spec and having checks for um, the clients implementing that spec, but without having to wholesale buy into everything that Lona offers because this is a different use case with different functionality. Lona also offers different levels of integration on the client. So if you have a native screen with some rich complex interaction and you don't want to make the whole screen server-driven UI, um, you can use it to render a single component on a screen in a screen that's otherwise completely custom native code. Um, you could also use Lona to render a full screen if you've got a screen that, that is good for this use case of Lona rendering the entire screen. And finally, if you've got a series of screens that can be rendered by Lona, Lona can actually handle the navigation as well. So you could have a series of screens that Lona is rendering. Now I'm going to talk a bit about how Lona makes versioning a little more scalable as well. So a common scenario with server-driven UI is you build out an initial system with an initial set of components, but then your designers come up with some other change. They want you to add some more things to the system. So you build out some new components. You add some new properties. So far, so good. You push these changes to a new app version, and then you turn the API changes on. So what's wrong with this? Well, if you work with native apps, you know some users are never going to update. Um, you're always going to have people who want to stay on old clients and old versions of the app for a long time. Because of this, a successful server-driven UI system has to accommodate an API that evolves faster than your users will update, meaning you have to help, uh, you have to keep supporting those older versions of the app for a long time. So how we handle this in the reservations system is that we versioned by the app version. Um, and this works pretty well because our reservation system is only being used in one place by one service. But when you take something like Lona, where you're scaling this to a lot of different services, a lot of different parts of the app, and a lot of teams with different use cases, you need to have something a little more robust for versioning. So for that reason, Lona uses an explicit client version number. And teams can, can opt to upgrade to whatever client version number makes sense for them. Lona is also backwards compatible. And it implements fallbacks. So that means um, even if you add some new functionality to your system, you can still support those older clients with components that they know about. OK, so let's review. Um, this is how Lona is taking server-driven UI and scaling it to a much more general use case. Lona lets teams decide what level of integration makes sense for them. Um, it makes full use of our design language system, so we're, we're taking advantage of the momentum we have with a library that developers are already using. Um, we make sure that the responses coming from the back end are always going to be something that the client understands. We're eliminating the boilerplate of having to manually write out data models, because those get generated for us. Um, we use CodeGen to make the epoxy models and CI tests run smoothly and more in a more automated fashion. And finally, Lona is really intentional about explicitly versioning and having intentional fallbacks. So we know that 
we will always support older clients um, with Lona. And those are some of the ways that we've used server-driven UI at Airbnb to launch products to millions of users across Android, iOS, and web. Um, thanks for listening, and I'll take a look at the Slido questions. Okay, I'll pause for one sec so people can take a photo if they want the slides. Okay, um, so the first question I'll take is this one about internationalization. This is an easy question. So, um, yeah, Airbnb is a global company. Oh. Let me mirror this. Okay, so there's a question about internationalization here. Um, so, yeah, Airbnb is a global company because we're a travel company. So. We definitely take into account internationalization. Um, so how that's handled is that uh, we send up the content in these systems from the server. So the server will query our uh, translation system and get the right, the right language for the client. And if the client changes, changes language or they switch locales, then we'll refetch that data for them. Um, let's see. OK, this is a good question. Um, what kind of apps or companies do you think uh, should consider using server-driven UI. Um, so this is a really this is a really great system for uh, screens that are really simple or something where it's really easy to translate across Android, iOS, and web in terms of like UI. So if your screen looks pretty similar across platforms, that's a really good candidate for using server-driven UI. Um, and another good use case is something where it's a lot of boilerplate. It's something you've done before. Uh, and you feel like it's, a, it's really easy to render like that list of components. Um, some examples where server-driven UI might not be a good choice are if you've got a really highly interactive native interaction um, or something that's using a lot of state across, um, uh, using a lot of state across the server-driven part and the non-server-driven part, that gets really tricky and you might want to consider just implementing natively your screen. Um, another example is if you've got really particular performance constraints for a screen, um, like for instance, we have a screen where there's a lot of really specific to that screen pagination going on, that would be difficult to implement in a really generalized server-driven system. Um, you might want, in that case, to consider the costs and benefits of creating a system that would be more generalized. Okay. Does the UI support disconnected airplane mode? Um, I can answer this specifically for the reservation screen. So uh, our reservations are available offline. And so how we handle this with server-driven UI is that we, we just cache the entire JSON response for each reservation um, so that it will be available if the user's offline. Um, this would get a little more complicated with something like Wally, where you have different flows. And I think that you could still support an offline use case, but you might want to think really hard about what you want to offer from a user experience perspective in that case. Because if a user is going through a really long form, even if they can go through it in offline mode, it's tricky to make that experience seamless so that if they made a mistake on step one and suddenly they become offline, how are you going to surface that error when they're on step 20? So um, it's definitely possible to support offline mode with server-driven UI but you're probably gonna to wanna to think about your user experience and exactly the offline experience you want that user to have if you're thinking about whether this makes sense or not. Um, let's see, do you have versioning for JSON data model changes? And how do you handle backwards compatibility if a new field needs to be added to an existing component? Um, so, so the changes, so I went over versioning a little bit. We, we will version like all of these clients and how it, exactly it's versioned depends on the system. So sometimes it's versioned by the app number, uh, the, 
or sometimes it's versioned by an explicit library number. Um, how we handle backwards compatibility is an interesting question. So if it's something related to nullability, um, that can get kind of tricky because uh, especially if you're caching your, your JSON models, um, you don't want to have something where uh, you're expecting a field and it's not there. So sometimes because of nullability, it might be easier to create a new component and just support that going forwards um, and substitute a different one, a different existing component that's already supported in your older clients. Um, and then in the case of Lona, uh, Backwards compatibility is something they thought about from the start, so they have a really good system for, um, for making sure that, that something that's supported in, in an older version is always going to be supported thereon. Um, the next question I'll answer is, how long did it take to get this pattern implemented across iOS, Android, and web? Um, for the generic reservation system, we built that out over maybe like three months, something like that, to get kind of an initial set of components. And we've had it running for like maybe a year and a half. And so since then, we've added like a considerable number of things to the system. Um, I would say that in general, getting people to think about server-driven UI, uh, it was something that happened over maybe the course of about a year where teams would start building out the system and they would talk to other teams. Um, and other product teams having similar issues would would also start using server-driven UI. So throughout the course of maybe a year, this is like the amount of time where it, it went from almost no teams using server-driven UI to a lot of teams using this as one way of doing some, some kinds of native development. Let's see, and then I think the last question that I haven't answered is, the API that drives Airbnb clients seems pretty specific to the client display. Does the server, pa server UI power Airbnb's public HTTP API as well? I don't think I totally understand this question, so if the person is in the audience, maybe I can get some clarity. Um, but in general, like not all of our screens at Airbnb are server driven. Um, like I said, there's some use cases where it really makes sense to implement things in a custom native way. Native way. Um, so we have some screens that are driven by this API that are kind of specific to the um, specific to this API, and then we have other parts of the app that are totally not server driven. All right, let me just refresh. Let's see anything else? All right, I think that's it. Sure. That's an interesting question. So the, the question was, um, how do we handle responsive, uh, re responsive screen sizes? So um, the, components, uh, the components are meant to, uh, the components in our design language system are meant to work for different screen sizes. So part of that's taken care of by our component library. But um, we've run into this use case where, depending on what the UI is, we might have to have a separate response for desktop versus a mobile size screen. And I think that kind of depends on your use case. And this might also be something that can help you assess whether server-driven UI makes sense for your use case. But sometimes we'll have a situation where like, maybe there's a side panel on, on desktop web where we want to embed the screen, and the rest of the screen has something else in it. And in that case, we might opt to make kind of a third response from our API, which is the desktop size one. Um, but it can get tricky because a user can also just resize their window. Um, and you might have to refetch the response in that case. So I think that's a tricky question and something that is important to consider when you're first building out a system. Um, let's see, so the question was uh, asking about like maintaining one session across uh, kind of multiple screens. So is, are you asking about Wally specifically?
Um, let's see. I think the way I think that the way Wally works is it's blocking. So like, if a user fills out a form, uh, you send the request, and then you get a response which has like the updated anything updated in Wally. Um, but Yeah, yeah. I think you could build out a system that does that has more of that offloaded to the client, but it'd probably be more complicated. Yeah. You mentioned rules about availability. Uh, what was the, what, if that was a word for whatever, was uh, the most challenging caching problem that you came into with whether it was version or whatever you guys? Okay, so the question was the most challenging caching problem we've had. Um, I think with the reservation system, we don't have the same safeguards built into it that uh, we do with, say, Lona. And so I think a lot of it was just the typical thing you'll get with building with native clients, which is trying to reason about older versions of the client and how your cache might break because you're storing an old version of the API response. Um, so there's a few ways to deal with that. I think the best one is just having really good documentation on versioning and having these automated like CI checks. Um, that will go across different versions and different clients. Um, the other thing is, let's see, you can also build safeguards into your cache, like depending on how important that information is, where if it doesn't know how to deserialize something, you, you actually do a blocking fetch for the new response. Uh, but that's not the best user experience because you're caching that for a reason. Yeah. Anything else? All right, I think that's it. Thanks. Thanks.